Well, let me welcome to the Life Magnetics podcast, Krishna Avalon. Krishna is a licensed acupuncturist, a certified holistic health coach, a Psych K facilitator, a pranayama breathwork guide, and somatic practitioner who has guided over 24,000 patients and clients to their health and wellness goals for the last 18 years. Krishna currently specializes in subconscious transformation. Welcome to the podcast, Krishna. Thank you so much. I love how you read that. It was like slow and intentional. Yeah, was I was thinking about each it. word. <laughs> I could tell. I could tell. Thank you. You're very welcome. Why don't we just start by having you uh, introduce yourself to my audience and maybe touch upon what drew you to the work that you currently do? Yeah. Well, I mean... I was an acupuncturist forever. I came into that work really entirely by intuition so many years ago. And when I had been doing that at the beginning, nobody even really knew what acupuncture was. I mean, some people did, but it is not like it is now. Uh, and that was a path that I just followed 1000% without any doubt and was really blessed to just have a really thriving career and move all over the place and support my family. And, um, you know, I loved that work so much and I still do, but it was just really time for me to grow after doing it for so long, after reaching a state of what I would call mastery, just because I had worked with so many people really well, it was time for me to grow. I just didn't know what that was going to look like and how I could get off that. Like I call it the very well oiled track, you know, that you're just like in the groove. It's kind of hard to get off when it's just mm -hmm. like so much of your identity. It's how you're supporting your family. And I'd heard about Psyche, which is the process that I was trained in on a podcast several years ago. And I was just like, it was the same sort of thing. My intuition was like, ding, yes. And there aren't very many things in my life that I've had that kind of yes to. The first one was acupuncture school. Second one was being a mother. Both those things, so natural for me. And so I went and had a session with the one person in town who did it, my teacher, whose house I now live in. She lived here for 25 years and taught here for 12. And it was a really magical story how I got this house. But um, I had a session with her and honestly, I really didn't feel much difference. And it's because she wasn't my facilitator. She is not very intuitive. She's not a great space holder. <laughs> she was my teacher. I ended up doing all four of the trainings during the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, like so many of us, I had this time and space. I had to close my clinic down. And so it was time to pivot. And she just happened to teach the classes, all four levels here in this house and I just knew 100% I wanted to do it because when I started learning about the subconscious mind, I mean, I became obsessed because as you know, the subconscious creates 90 to 95% of our life's experiences because it's where our beliefs are stored. It's where our habits are, where we're on autopilot. And so as a person naturally that is into healing, had my own healing to do wanted to be able to even help my patients more at a deeper level. I mean, it was just natural. And so now here we are in this time, right? Where like everybody talks about their wounding and their triggers and their inner child and their shadow. This is the work for that. And it's direct. It's simple. It's conscious. You don't have to be hypnotized. You know, it's like just very everything I love, simple, direct, quick, <laughs> conscious. <laughs> Um, and so that's kind of the long answer, but a short answer. To find out. Well, I want to ask you, um, kind of a different question before we get into all of that. Cause I have so many curiosities around everything that you do, but I wanted to talk about you as a child, because in my experience, someone's life purpose and the work that they came here to do usually kind of shows up in the nature of the child, whether that's an intuition or an empathy. So what kind of a child were you? And were you always someone who kind of worked, wanted to work with energy or work to help people and heal people? Yeah. Thank you for asking. And I love that I can talk with you about this, not as like 
some wounded traumatic place. It's just, this is what happened. So I came into my mother's womb in an unconscious way. My mom was not conscious. And so she was very young and she was very Catholic. My family's huge. My grandmother and grandfather had 17 children. And so in that time of 1974, my grandparents didn't know what to do with my pregnant mother other than kick her out of town and tell her to not come back until she had a husband. So I came into this unconscious place, the shame, my mother's getting kicked out of the tribe, the not belonging, not being accepted. And then I was raised in a way that was very loving. Like I love my grandparents. I have incredible childhood memories, but in the Catholic church, definitely a lot of martyrdom, definitely a lot of shame, a lot of victim, even in my family lineage, especially the women. And so I just never fit in, but was constantly taught that I should fit in with all these white people who were Catholic repenting. And so I was just very like acting out, you know, I had things in my life that just reinforced those beliefs that I came into that energy that I came into reinforced all my life. So I had like this kind of parallel or conflicting thing where I was like really pretty and really popular, but also I had these deep beliefs that I wasn't worthy. I wasn't accepted. I couldn't trust myself for who I was. I didn't freaking know what was going on. I just was really lost and then started acting out, being reckless, being unconscious in my behavior, hurting everyone around me just with my recklessness. And I just didn't know. I didn't know how badly I was hurting. And so, you know, luckily I did find acupuncture school and that was such a natural calling for me. And I do believe that when I was younger, I was always a space holder. I was always an old soul. I was always more like a parent to my mom, who was such a young soul. And I love her so much and she didn't know any better. But it's like when she's around my daughter now, it's like they're the kids <laughs> and I just <laughs> cook and clean up after them. And I, and thank God I've done my inner child work and I don't expect her to be what she'll never be to me. But yeah, I can just say those are the huge lessons of my life. And if I had not found acupuncture, had I not found the kind of breath work that I love and guide other people through, if I hadn't found the nervous system regulation practices that I do and teach people somatics and myself too, so that I can drive on the highway without having panic attacks, that kind of thing, teaching myself to feel safe in my body. So that's kind of like everything and how I came into this work. And then, yeah, I just know, and you know too, that when a healer or a healing practitioner has had experiences and they've healed and worked with their wounds and then they integrated them, then they become embodied. That's the person you want to learn from. You can tell, right? When you're like on Instagram and someone's trying to front all this stuff that they want to teach you or show you or think they know. And you're like, yeah, I'm not feeling that from you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can say, yeah, I've gone through all that. Mm. Would you say if you had been conceived in a conscious way, like two people coming together in a loving way, creating something intentionally, do you think that your transit and your ultimate path would have been different? Do you think it's passed down, in other words, the consciousness of the mother and even the grandmother to the child, which dictates their ultimate experiences? I love that question. I 100% believe that to be true. Yes, everything about my spiritual experience would be different, but my lessons would be different. And, you know, my biggest lessons are to trust myself, to accept myself, to feel worthy and deserving of love without having to give all of myself away, give my power away. So, yeah, of course, you know, and I can look at other people now who've been blessed with that kind of like loving, intentional upbringing or like all kinds of privilege. And I no longer feel resentful or jealous. I'm just, it's like, oh, wow. Yes, that is an option in life. And their <laughs> lessons are going to be so different than mine. So. 
Well, you mentioned a little while ago feeling safe in the body, and I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that because my observation of the world right now, and I've been on the planet since 1968, things are so different. And I definitely sense and can see on social media people detaching from who they are, like whether it's filters on Instagram or wanting to be a Kardashian stereotype or face tune, just kind of looking for an external principle of body and trying to project that. Or, for example, me, I mean, I come from a very abusive childhood and I remember still just not wanting to be in my physical body when it was happening. And so I would create through my imaginal mind spaces and places in the astral where I could kind of detach from the body. And as a result of that, I disconnected so profoundly that I ended up with eating disorders. I ended up harming my body. I just didn't have a love for it. I really didn't even know my own body that housed my soul. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about what's happening on the planet right now, people outside of their body. And for somebody who wants to very quickly get back into relationship with their body, how is that possible? How would they even do that? Oh, no, I love that so much. I mean, that's what I teach people all day long. And so, you know, if we wanted to talk about the subconscious, sometimes the subconscious believes that it's not safe to be in your body. It's not safe to be who you are. It's not safe to just trust your own self and not everything that's being told to you. It's, you need to give your power away. So I would say the magic for me, and I've been exposed to a lot of amazing healing modalities the subconscious mind and the nervous system. That's my lens. That's my specialty. That's where I feel like I can make the most impact with myself and in guiding other people, you know, in space holding and being in service. I feel like that is my highest service. Um, and I want to keep studying both of them. I am obsessed. I mean, as a human being, I'm also a very spiritual being. And I love to like go off of planet earth or walk between the worlds in my meditation. And, um, but yeah, I feel like being grounded and being embodied, that is something that a lot of people are not able to do, but it's a lot of what people come to me for with psyche. And do wanting they, do actually they, to experience they, more joy and more presence. Hmm. Like they're not present with their kids or in their mm -hmm. lives. And so they, they don't understand why they're not connecting. They don't understand why they're drinking so much. And so we work with creating beliefs in the subconscious that that's possible in a variety of ways. So I wonder if uh, they come to you seeking an outcome in a specific area of their life. I want joy or I wanna have a better relationship with my children. And they don't really know that it's because there's this disconnect that's happening in their body. Often when, you know, students will come, they think they want to have this, but they need to receive this in order to get that in the first place. So um, the level of consciousness of your, your patients and your clients, why do they normally seek you out, do you think? Do, do they have a realization that they need this or is it a symptom that's happening in their life? I don't think that they mostly realize that. I think that people who know that I'm now doing this subconscious transformation work after being an acupuncturist forever, because I do post in my stories, a lot of those people are my patients already who I've worked with with acupuncture or family members of the people I've worked with. Um, I think most people are just like super anxious and super stressed. And then when they don't know where that comes from and they come in here and I'm just reminding of the, of the basics, like you can't wake up and scroll your phone. You need to turn your phone off an hour before bed. If you're not sleeping, you need to practice tuning into what's going on inside of you and not everything that's going on outside of you. And for some people that makes them more anxious. So then we'll use like signals from the body instead trying to talk the mind into being quiet, for instance, you know, like different ways of working with however a person's anxiety is manifesting so that they can learn how to be in their bodies and present and trust themselves that they're safe. Huge. As a he very much. Um, as a healer and someone who had to walk the walk in order to get to the place you are in order to turn back and bring others with you, 
I know that there's a state of embodiment and wholeness and standing in, in an empowered way within the healing. But I also know that we can still click out, even as healers click out of alignment or click into a state of forgetfulness. Oh, and my suffering is telling me I've got to get back into alignment. I think for people who want to pursue healing and becoming a practitioner, they worry that they're too broken or that they haven't got it all figured out or they haven't made, they haven't figured out how to be healed all the time. You know what I mean? Do you have anything to say to that? Yeah, yeah I love that question so much too, because it's like, sometimes we have to create the belief again in the subconscious mind, something along the lines of, I accept myself exactly as I am. If you don't, I gave this example the other day on a podcast. I hate it when my mom tells me I look tired. I hate it. She tells me anyway, right? The other day I showed up on a podcast and she was like going to my own minute and I could tell she was, but I was like chill, but I was also in, I was kind of in it with like a dating situation I've been in that I got triggered about, but I wasn't unpresent. In fact, I was incredibly present, but I wasn't matching her energy in any way. And so when she came on, she was like, are you okay? You seem kind of low vibration. Do you need to reschedule? And I wasn't even doing anything. I was just kind of like, no. And I had been meditating, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, actually, I'm just in it. I was like, but I'm totally ready to have this conversation. Like, this is just how I am, but I'm showing up. And she thanked me at the end because she's like, you gave me so much permission to just show up authentically because I didn't feel like I had to front anything. And the old me would have been like, oh my God, I need to shift and like rearrange myself to make this person more comfortable. Or I need to be something other than what I am. No, you don't. No, I don't. And that's because I've done a lot of this expansion in my subconscious to know that I am worthy of love or being seen or being heard exactly as I am. And we had the most beautiful conversation. And she, she was, she was so grateful after that. And, you know, now I'm coaching, like she signed it up, signed up with me for some coaching stuff. And <laughs> it's just kind of like that. Um, yeah. yeah. I hope that answered your question. It, it, it does. And I, I think that it's important to recognize that the healer needs healing too. And it's an ongoing process. And for me, every time I think I've healed something from my past, something else bubbles up and reminds me, oh, we're not done with that yet. There's a whole nother layer that you've got to get into. And it's perfectly okay to be exactly where you are, wherever you are in the process, as long as you continue to move in it, right? So um, one thing that came to mind talking about feeling safe in your body, I would imagine that there are some circumstances where people aren't actually safe. Maybe something's happening to them in the circumstance or situation. Maybe the body itself is um, unwell or attacking itself. You know, it might not actually be a safe experience in the physicality. Is there a way to get safe in the spirit, safe in the mind in order to then have that out pictured into the body? I mean, that's such a fair question. And so for that person, I would have them notice a sensation happening in their body and then work with that. So there are techniques, for instance, where, you know, anxiety can make you like this. Everything in your neck and your jaw and your shoulders are up in your ear and you're so tight and you're so clenched. I mean, that's how I experience anxiety. And so you can, for instance, imagine your neck like a block of ice that you melt into water. And maybe you can't do that when you're in a very unsafe situation. But if you're in my treatment space, laying on my table, what you want to do is practice that kind of thing one breath at a time. Just one breath at a time so you can come up and down what we call the ladder in nervous system language. One breath at a time so that you're not always up here in fight or flight, survival, looking for danger or the next thing you have to get done or the opposite where you're on the very bottom playing dead because everything's too overwhelming and that's your survival strategy. You want to be able to go up and down. And so the nervous system, the way to work with it is to train it one breath at a time and you're like adding drops of water to a bucket. So to your point, there are a lot of people that don't feel safe. 
But you want to like any opportunity you have where you're not needing to fight for your life, using something like that to practice. Or even just like a hand on your heart being like, mm-hmm. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going to leave you. You know, I do stuff like that for myself when I'm mm-hmm. driving in the car on the freeway and it's nighttime and raining and there are semis all over. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. So it is possible. Your situation doesn't have to be calm and you don't, there ha- there doesn't need to be like a supreme readiness to engage in the work. It's just showing up and providing the space to get something done. And what you can do, like in that moment where I am like, everything's tightening up in me on the freeway and I could have a panic if I didn't have tools using what works for me, smelling some essential oil, you know, making sure I'm resourced before I get on the highway. I have food, I have water, I have a scoop of nut butter for my nerves. I have some ashwagandha tincture, you know, the nervous system and the body love it when you are resourced. And when you give yourself space and options, that's another way to just Mm -hmm. work with your Mm -hmm. nervous system and teach yourself that you are, you're safe and you got yourself. I love that. Um, I believe where we touch on our own body, that's where your consciousness immediately goes to. You become present where you touch, which is why you see so many statues in prayer mudra, just touching the actual heart chakra to be present right there and getting into center so quickly. It's one of the easiest ways to do that. Let's talk now (laughs) about the subconscious because I teach on this subject. I typically teach from the perspective of Neville Goddard. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Goddard. He's got this book called Feeling is the Secret. And his supposition is that the conscious is the thinking or the masculine aspect of who it is that we are. And the subconscious is the female or the womb of creation, which ultimately animates what we think, but also what we feel. And feeling is a secret because if you're thinking it, if you've got your vision board and you're looking at it, but you're not feeling it, then the subconscious doesn't really receive the cue to create it for you. But it seems to me that the way you kind of describe it on your website, if if I'm correct, I don't know, but let me ask, is kind of like it's this underworld of who it is that we are, this place where we're keeping and storing patterns, belief systems, ideas of self and others, and we're largely unconscious to it. And so is part of the work that you do with the subconscious, bringing those things up and then becoming conscious and then telling the truth if it's a lie or tell me about the subconscious in your work. I'd, I'd love to hear it. I love how you ask questions. First of all, it's like, oh, good. <laughs> well, I'm just, curious. Yeah. I, yeah. I really like it. So I, if you're a visual person, I offer, it's like looking at an iceberg and we see like the top 10% um, above the water. That's the conscious mind. And then beneath the surface, everything we can't see, that's like 90% of that iceberg. That's the subconscious. The conscious mind feeds into the subconscious and we need both of them, but ideally they're working in harmony. So the conscious mind, you know, that's like what we can do with meditation. It's what we can do with mantras or affirmations. Um, I will say that if you're not working with the subconscious, because it does control 90% of our lives, it is going to take so much longer to work with just the conscious mind. And so when I'm in a session with somebody, we are using both because we're talking about what's going on with you. You don't necessarily need to know what your subconscious limitations are, but we do balances in Psych K. And one of the balances is for peacefully unattaching from a stress or trauma. So if there is something that's occupying a lot of your headspace or you're having a hard time moving on from, that is the absolute perfect thing to work with because In the balance, we help you peacefully unattach, creating a new pathway in the mind through the balance so that you can have a new experience. That's neuroplasticity. Another balance that I work with with people when I'm just doing like one to three sessions with them is we call it a goal statement balance. And again, you don't need to know where you're limited. You just need to know what you want. 
So we talk about what you want and on your own and maybe with my guidance, usually with my guidance, you come up with like the statement. What you're doing is you're creating the belief in your subconscious for it to be possible because if it's not existing in the subconscious currently, it won't happen. So your conscious mind might be telling you, I deserve this, that, and the other. But if your subconscious does not have that expanded belief to what you want, you it won't happen. And so we all know this for ourselves and we know other people who just repeat same cycles over and over. They might get to a certain place and then shit might fall apart or they might set self-sabotage or, you know, it's just like same theme over and over. That's the subconscious. Do you have to believe it's possible in order to implant a new truth? Because sometimes when you are trying to affirm wellness, maybe in the subconscious, it would be difficult. How do you bypass somebody's predisposed belief that they're not well? You know what I mean? Like, do, don't they have to believe that it's possible in the first place? How do you get them to the place of possibility? Exactly. That's another great question. We just talk about what you want. Mm-hmm. And then create it as a possibility in the mind. And then there's an action step. That's the last part of a goal statement balance. And action is important to reinforce this new pathway that you've created. So it's not just about like, say, making a vision board. You actually have to like do action in your life to create what you want on that vision board. You know, kind of like your book, the masculine and the feminine aspects of it. Um, and so somebody could come in super skeptical, for instance, if that's what you mean, but we just do the balance and then I kind of step back. And what happens is people are always texting me afterwards and telling them me, or I'll check in with them and be like, Hey, have you noticed anything? What about this, this, and this? I mean, I have yet to hear somebody that hasn't had some shifts and some of them mm -hmm. that are just so epic and so transformative and so powerful. Um, you know, when I first did this work, yes, it was intuitive. Yes. I knew I wanted to do it, but I still, I offered that one balance to like 20 of my patients just cause I wanted to, I wanted to see what was possible. It was that transformation of stress balance for things that like, I know these people well enough to be like, oh my God, this balance would be it. Like, this is the way I could help you most. Every single person, I mean, just blowing me away. And like, I have a ton of testimonials on my website about it because it's the best way people can understand how this work is possible or what is possible using it. Um, hmm. I love skeptics because when you show skeptics that something works, they become the biggest fans. Yes. Demonstrate that it's possible. Repeat it. Now I'm sold and I believe it. Does this kind of subconscious work trans transcend timelines? Because there's this idea, of course, of epigenetics and my mother passes down to me her ancestral stuff from her mother and so on and so forth. And now I carry this in the body and in the mind and spirit. So if someone comes to you to get in touch with what's animating and outpicturing their life, do you ever kind of go back into those other spaces and places? You just gave me an idea for a balance that I want to do for myself. Good. We can create okay. a goal okay. statement of like, you know, my epigenetics are like, <laughs> or my family lineage line around this, that, and the other is like free and clear and updated now, you know, creating that as a possibility because the neuroscience is showing now that our perceptions are more impactful than genetics. So why not try to work with that? I mean, that's huge. But yes, really? I do feel that way anyway. I do feel like we inherit things spiritually through our DNA, through lineage. I, I believe all of that. Like, how couldn't we be affected by that is my belief. But Right. So do you ever have clients or patients that come to you that are exhibiting some kind of a physical behavior that immediately allows you to identify what's happening in the subconscious? For example, I've... I'm carrying around 20 or 25 extra pounds. I've been doing it for three years now. I've been trying to work with my perceptions about it, but is that tied to kind of a standard subconscious belief 
that you as a practitioner would identify immediately? Yes, I'm going to plug in my computer while I'm talking to you. <laughs> sure, sure. Absolutely. No problem. I'm going to get a drink um, of water. It's fine. <laughs> yes, but I also have that lens of being an acupuncturist as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like, is it related to sleep? Is it related to your hormones? And then a lot of us as women, especially, we do hold weight as armor because maybe it wasn't safe for us to be in our bodies and receive certain kind of attention at one point. So yeah, but I do read energy for a living. You know, I, I always feel and I sometimes see and I'm just really intuitive, but yes, to answer, to answer your question, but naturally I would want to ask you more questions too. Right. So you deal with people one-on-one -on -one as clients and patients getting into the consciousness and the subconscious. Do you believe in a collective unconscious or subconscious? And what do you think? And if so, what do you think the power of that is? And how is it showing up on the planet right now? I, of course, do. I mean, we had real good example of that with COVID and the amount of fear and the amount of not feeling safe. And I know what it was like to be myself and just have my own experience and the experience of my family and of the people that would come to me for, for healing. That's my community. That's how I read the energy of the world. And I also know what it would be like if I was reading the news all day long. And so in that way, I know what it's like to have a collective conscious and subconscious because the people that come to me, they show me what's going on in the world. And so I know, I know, and then just even in the programming, you know, a lot of what we watch, I, mean, I don't watch very many things, but like anytime I do, it seems to be the same theme all the time. Like, and I, I won't even go down that rabbit hole, but why? <laughs> I want to design for a reason, the mm -hmm. music that we mm -hmm. listen to, you know, there's so much pop music I love, but if it's like, if I tell my daughter, I'm like, if I listen to that on repeat, that is not good for me. Okay. They're just teaching you that you're not whole. You're not lovable. You don't feel good. You're not right. Unless you have this person's love or unless you have more drinks or, you know, whatever it is, it's like that kind of programming. So yes, I right. do believe that there's a collective conscious and subconscious. I believe that's all by design. Because if everybody knew that they were a brilliant, limitless creator, we're not very controllable, are we? We are not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is true. That's, that is so uh, interesting that you mentioned music because I remember during a specific time in my life, I was so down. <clears throat> it's my second marriage. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to be in that marriage. And I had a friend ask me, are you listening to that music because you're depressed or are you depressed because you're listening to that music? Like you really ought to determine <laughs> what is causing your emotional state. And I had never thought of it that way, but word, like all of the music that I was listening to was very yeah. low vibration, very depressive. Okay. And it just allowed that emotional state within me to grow. And there are so many things that do that to us. And I think we are, living so reactively as people just kind of responding to what's being shot out at us. We've got the Ukraine war, we've got the politics, we've got the divisiveness, we've got inflation, like there's so much to react to that it's difficult for folks to just get intentional. And it's only when you're yeah. intentional that you create the outcomes that you want. I ask about the collective consciousness because sometimes when I consider that, I think, well, I'm not in control of everybody else. I can't really help what they're creating. I can only help what I'm creating, but it, does it make a difference to the whole, if I change myself, Krishna? Ding, 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 ding. I mean, that's what I learned to be my greatest service, honestly, is to follow what helps me feel most connected to myself, to follow what brings me the most peace, joy, love, happiness. And that doesn't mean that I'm selfish doesn't mean that I don't care. It means that 
is how I can help people the most. And I just believe that to be true. And it takes all kinds of medicines in this world, all kinds of voices, all kinds of energy and people and expression. For me, my medicine, that's my medicine. And I used to feel like ashamed for not reading the news, for not knowing more what's going on in all of the world. Um, it's my survival strategy as well. And I don't feel bad about that anymore. You know, I have expanded my own self-worth and deservingness for, for, you know, the best that love and life have to offer for being worthy of a peaceful life, a peaceful experience for creating beauty in this world. I would say that like the most important things for me in my life to experience are growth, to be inspired, love and beauty. And so, you know, I know that about myself. It took me a long time to get there. But that's what I know. I, Do I have I think, mad respect for the people out there marching the streets mm -hmm. and like fighting for things? Heck yeah, I do. And I'll hold space for them when they need some healing. I love that you say that because I think that there's an impression that if you're not doing the work the same way someone else is doing the work, then you're not doing anything or what you're offering is not valuable. And I think that the activist has her place. And I think that the meditator on the mountain has her place. They're both equally important, just doing it in a different way. And we should drop all of the judgment to be sure. I did want to ask you, Krishna, if, if someone has issues and they know these issues are causing things to happen in their life a certain way, and they want to make a change, traditionally, you might go to a therapist, right? You, you talk through that. And you'd stay in therapy. My experience with therapy, just to be honest with you, I think it was good for a season, but at some point it felt like I was just going over the same track over and it was almost embedding the trauma as opposed to lifting it and releasing it. So what is the difference between analysis and therapeutics, talk therapy, traditional, and the kind of work that you do? And can somebody do it more quickly with your modality than a conventional therapist? You're literally asking me my favorite questions. Oh, good. Yes. I am working with some of the favorite people I'm working with right now have been in talk therapy for 15 and 20 years, and they intellectually and consciously understand why things are the way they are. They love their therapists. They love talking. Are they still stuck, angry, triggered, resentful on a bunch of pharmaceuticals? Yeah. And then they come in here and do like four or five sessions and everyone in their life is like, you're different. What is going on with you? How are you moving through life and all that's going on? Your divorce, job change, kid with special needs. Like, how are you doing that without drinking all the time and being super angry like you? It's because of this work. It's absolutely because of this work. And I have a lot of examples like that. I mean, I'm even thinking, I just finally paid off my student loans about a year and a half ago from acupuncture <laughs> school. I'm thinking about getting my, uh, my licensed clinical social work. I don't want to be a social worker or a mental health therapist, but I would love to bring the subconscious work to a bigger audience. And so it's crossing my mind that that could be something that I could offer that's super special and would get it out there to more people. And I could really do this for the rest of my life virtually. And so it's, mm -hmm. I, I have, I just had a couple meetings yesterday with two different schools and I'm like, do I want to do this? I mean, I would love to just be doing this stuff without having to get that degree, but I can also see where the degree would be really beneficial. So. How, long is your average client with you? So if they've got a lot of problems when they're coming to you, how many sessions should they expect to hang out with you and do the work? I have, my favorite people did like do subconscious transformation. So that's a series of 10 sessions, but they won't, none of them have even completed them yet. I have a lot of people who've done like five, six, seven sessions. But after those first few, you know, you can spread them out. I have a lot of people do three, three series. I have a lot of people who do one who they're just like, 
I don't really understand what this is, but I want to see what it does for me, that kind of thing. And then they're still integrating that one session. So. So, but it's not like three years, yeah. <laughs> unless no. you take three years to go. No, to I would say okay. 10 sessions, you are going to absolutely transform your life and you don't need to do them all within three, four months, you know? I, the people who are making the hugest impacts that did have a lot on their plate and a lot of stuff they wanted to work through. I would say nobody's done 10, but the ones I'm working with right now who've made such big changes, they've done like five, six sessions. And now mm -hmm. they don't have to come in every week or two weeks or a month. They're like still kind of integrating some of the other stuff. That sounds great <laughs> because when I yeah. think about it, it's exhausting with everything else that I have to do in my life to expect to be in therapy for three years to clear trauma is just, you know, and I, yeah, that just sounds simple and it sounds um, it, better. It's, and it's also more enjoyable. Like I didn't, you know, I've had good talk therapy in my life and it was cause they asked the right questions and they were playful and they knew how to hold space, but like talk therapy in general is not my jam. So mm -hmm. I love that in this work, I get to focus on what you want and I get to help you get unstuck. For a lot of people talking about their stressful stuff is super triggering. That's why I'm like, do I want the licensed clinical social worker for, you know, marriage and couple family counseling? Like, I don't wanna be a counselor. I just want to help people feel empowered as creators of their lives and focus on what they want. And that's why I do. I love this. I love this method because it's, that's what we do. It sounds amazing. Now would a client, when they visit with you and have sessions with you, are they receiving like resources and tools that they can run for themselves when they find themselves in reaction or whatever, or is it more about, uh, programming the subconscious to the belief in the possibility, or is it both? I always try to give people things that they can do on their own. I wouldn't say it's part of the psych K process that I was trained in. First of all, I don't like the name psych K. It stands for psychology plus kinesiology. Kinesiology okay. means muscle testing. So I tend to call it subconscious transformation because that is what I want to do with people. That's my skill set. I'm a space holder, I'm a somatic practitioner, I'm super intuitive, and now I have this subconscious transformation tool. Um, I forgot what your question was. <laughs> whether like they have like your your patients like have a process or something, or whether it's just something that gets yes. embedded and then okay. Yes. I love to give people homework, but in the balance where we're doing a goal statement, mean, there are many balances. Those two main ones I talked about, those are just like the ones I work with the most for people I'm just having like one to three sessions with, but there are other balances that take longer that are amazing. Um, but in the goal statement balance, there is that action step. And if your subconscious looks back at your notes that I give you and sees, oh, I did that action step, what that does is so powerful and it's not even like, doesn't even have to be this huge thing. It's just that the pathway gets reinforced when you have done that action step and your subconscious sees that you've done that action step. And then it becomes easier for the subconscious to seek that information out in the world to reinforce your new belief. Because you're trying to create that well-traveled path in the forest. Currently, mm -hmm. you're trying to override the one that you've taken a bazillion times. That's so familiar, probably not true, probably super limiting. Right. So you're also uh, a practitioner of pranayama breath work. And I just have a feeling that breath intersects very well with the work that you do with the subconscious. Can you speak to that or talk about the importance of breath? Yeah. I remember the first time I did this breath work was so, I was living in Chicago. I was at some kind of like event at my friend's, in my friend's living room. And I was like, whoa, like I had wanted to study it ever since I learned about it. Never really found a person that I was attracted to. I didn't like seek it out, but I would occasionally ask, Hey, do you know of anybody who teaches this kind of breath work? And they were all sort of like fluffy kind of hippie type peeps, not bad, just not my teacher. And then when I finally found my teacher, which was probably like six years ago, 
yeah, I went for that right away too. That is for clearing big emotion off the body. So talk about lineage stuff, ancestral stuff, collective stuff, or your own stuff. You don't even need to know where it's coming from. You're just letting the breath do all the work for you and clear it from your body. And I love doing both. So sometimes we'll do like three, four psych K sessions, hit something. Like you said, it's not like you ever need to stop expanding the universe, your relationships. People will show you where you're still trying to grow and expand. You won't ever have to do the same balances again, but you will keep getting shown, oh, I still need to grow in this area. I still need to grow my self-worth, what I deserve, how to not give my power away. I mean, those are the bait. Those are like the foundations of what most people work with anyway. And the yeah. breath helps to facilitate the movement through that. I do love the breath work for the emotion. That is my mm -hmm. go-to for the emotions. I like to say that I specialize in crying and helping people cry and get that stuff up and they're yelling and accessing their voice. So that's why I love combination sessions or like, you know, when I get to really coach people for 10 sessions, we'll bring in some breath work for sure. And then, you know, sometimes I'll drop people into a somatic meditation just because I want to, just because I'll teach them some tools, um, that action step, which is part of the psyche dogs. But then there are other things that I might suggest people do on their own. Like for instance, you don't need to know what your limiting or self-sabotaging beliefs are, but if you want to work with the subconscious, repetition is key. So having maybe one habit a day that you know would reinforce something you want to feel more of in your life, you start consciously doing that. I usually suggest people spend a couple few minutes in the morning, even a minute before you get out of bed. And then before you go to sleep, that state where you're like super sleepy or not quite awake yet, you know, when you're in a different part of brain waves, the theta ideally is where you're going to be most open and susceptible. And so, yeah, before you even go out, get out of bed, dropping into like the book you showed me, what do I want to feel? What does that look like? And not needing to figure it out with your mind, the steps, just like, what do I want to feel? What's an image I can associate with that? And then practice feeling those two things together, the feeling and the image. The subconscious loves images. So much more impactful than words. So I'll have people do stuff like that. Hmm. So the subconscious loves images. Why is that? That is such a great question. Maybe because the words activate the conscious part of the mind more. Um, yeah, I think because from what I know about the subconscious, the image and then the feeling are what's going to be most activating. Hmm. Whereas the mind does seem to like take over when we associate a bunch of words or numbers or, you know, logical brain thinking. Correct. Well, one final question before we close, and I just want to ask about spirit. You know, I'm a very spiritual person, um, very intuitive, but god is a big part not traditional christian god but like god is just a big part of what it is that i do and so where is it feels to me as we speak that spirit is all around and through the work that you do you seem very connected to spirit um but how do you relate to spirit what's your spiritual paradigm how does it show up in your work yeah thank you um you know i was raised catholic and that never worked for me and I was really opposed to the word God for a really long time for that reason. And I would say that when I found my meditation practice, which for me was first Vipassana, which was more about observing these sensations in your body and practicing not reacting to them and also not craving when it feels amazing so that you can practice equanimity, being equanimous, and when you learn that, you learn that everything is impermanent. And so you don't have to get all reactive about everything. So helpful. And then, you know, I think my connection to nature is just, that's my God. That's where things make sense for me. Um, 
I love quantum meditation. I love quiet. And I have a connection to something like so much bigger and higher than me. So I am a super spiritual person. I do say God now sometimes or the divine or source. What's also interesting is that during pandemic, some of the language that people with like Christ consciousness speak, I relate to that a lot, which is mostly about like, we are super sovereign beings who are so capable that God runs through all of us and the divine and that we're unity. Like we're all connected. We're all of the same source. And to me, I've never experienced more truth than that. Um, so I would say that. <laughs> that is very beautifully stated, Krishna. Oh, I love Thank that very you. much. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I, you know, I was in fundamentalist Christianity for over a decade. I mean, I was upset with the word God as well for quite some time. Very triggered by Jesus, but like it's taken me quite some time to kind of come around full circle and be reintroduced to the more eternal concepts underpinning all of these things. So beautiful. Well, Krishna, um, why don't you tell everybody how they can, well, we've already kind of talked about how they can work with you. I've been to your website though. There's a lot of cool offerings. Can you tell people if you've got something coming up that might interest them and, or how they can find you on the interwebs? I love that. Yeah, um, just my name, which is Krishna Avalon, is my website, and that does explain more about the subconscious transformation work, the process I was trained in, which is called Psych-K, certainly my bio. I talked here about my story. I can offer these sessions virtually, so the muscle testing, if anybody knows what that is, I just ask permission to muscle test on your behalf when we're doing a virtual session, mm. not like channeling your energy or doing anything weird. It's very simple. Um, and then there is a resource page on my website for some of those somatic practices and some breathwork practices that I did create that turned out, I think, really beautifully. I created them for like some corporate wellness apps. And then my newsletter, I don't send very many newsletters, but I am formulating something that will be very accessible, like maybe once a month on a Sunday evening, an hour healing where I can bring healing energy to the group, Reiki or something higher. I don't know that I call it Reiki anymore, but we'll just say Reiki or something higher. And then maybe muscle testing on behalf of the group for like a theme. Ooh. And so making that affordable for people. Um, yeah probably around awesome. some theme, probably with some kind of new moon or full moon, but I've been asked to do that by a few people now, different podcast hosts like yourself who are super connected and do cool work in the world. Um, so I'm really excited to collaborate. I love teaching and doing those kinds of things when I'm asked. It's like when I'm asked, invited, then it like invites me to rise. Um, yeah. So newsletter, website, and then I post in Instagram stories when I feel like it, when I'm inspired. And then I have a LinkedIn page. Wonderful. Well, I encourage all of our listeners to go and check that out. I spent a good amount of time on your website earlier today, just getting the vibe, uh -huh. trying to connect in to see what you're doing, the beautiful work that you're doing. Thank you so very much for spending time with me today and sharing yourself and your beautiful work. I've so enjoyed getting to know you, Krishna. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Likewise. I just feel like we're friends and um, me yeah, too. thank you for asking such thoughtful questions and um, just being so connected in your energy and a beautiful space holder yourself. 